And I think the mentality is n- it never hurts to try. Be persistent, mm-hmm. but not annoying, obviously. And try to create as many options for yourself as you can. Mm-hmm. And then good things will happen by creating options for yourself. Can you tell us more about like how do you grow up and how do you get into tech? I really, you know, a lot of people have these amazing stories about how maybe they were immigrants and they had, you know, some major challenge that they had to overcome, and and through that challenge they ended up, you know, figuring out what the meaning of life was. <laughs> I've been really blessed, honestly. I had、uh, amazing parents who were incredibly loving and a loving family.、Um, we grew up in an upper middle class type type household. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was really blessed in terms of everything that my parents, you know, kind of had given us、uh, in, in in all aspects of life, and being able to have good educational opportunities, you know, etc.、Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think back to different aspects of my life, and the one thing I would probably point to as an, a great learning opportunity is, I, at one point in my life, I was very shy. Mm-hmm. And I was terrified of public speaking, and just being embarrassed about things. And、um, that's been something that I took some some time to get over. But since then, I think because I was so shy, or because I was so nervous at times, I'm kind of the opposite of shy now. I'm extremely、mm-hmm. comfortable with kind of being myself, and、mm-hmm. and I would say that probably was like the biggest thing I quote unquote had to overcome in terms of tech. Um, I started off in consulting、mm-hmm. at a school. I went to a school and had no idea what I wanted to major in. So when you have no idea what you want to do in your life, you just say, "I'll become a consultant," because like that's、mm-hmm. just going to push off the decision even further.、Mm-hmm. And my biggest client happened to have been DoubleClick, and DoubleClick was in the late '90s, like 1997,、mm-hmm. 98, 99. It was really like the backbone of the internet because the internet was this free thing,、mm-hmm. and it was this incredible value for it to be free. And what made it free was the opportunity for having online ads. And DoubleClick was a leader in online advertising at the time, and they were my biggest client. And、um, Kevin Ryan at the time was the CEO,、mm-hmm. and he ultimately hired me、um, into human resources position, actually,、mm-hmm. uh, which is atypical to start off in human resources.、Mm-hmm. Um, and then fast forward, which I'm sure we'll get into at some point, but fast forward 23 years later, and Kevin Ryan is the person that acquired Meetup out of out of WeWork. So. Mm-hmm. Relationships matter, she said. In terms of like building these kind of mentorship, it sounds like he's a、uh, he eventually become a mentor to you. Curious, like how do you kind of form these kind of relationships? Say, you know, at the beginning, how did you encounter him, and then like what did he see in you, and then how did that goes in terms of relationship building? I mean, mentoring is probably one of the most important things that younger people can do, but it's also an important thing that people who have been Working for ten, twenty years can should also be doing, and、mm-hmm. and I really do believe that mentors can gain just as much as mentees. Meaning, it, a great relationship is not one that the mentor is always like helping a person, helping a person, helping a person. But there's great examples of people like Jack Welch, who passed away you know, less than a year ago, former CEO of GE. We used to always talk about he would mentor people, but people would mentor him and learning about the internet or learning about、mm-hmm. mobile. And and there's ways in which people who are being mentored can actually be a mentor to the mentor,、mm-hmm. quote unquote.、Mm-hmm. Um, so getting to getting back to, to us,、um, quick story. I was consulting to DoubleClick,、mm-hmm. and、uh, and what happened was Kevin. And I built a relationship because I was working with Kevin on building a new performance management plan for the company, new succession、mm-hmm. planning、uh, process for the company, and some other organizational development, human resource strategy issues.、Mm-hmm. And he basically at one point said to me, "He's like, what are you making?" <laughs> and I told him what I was making, and he knew how much we were billing out as a consultant, and we we're billing out like six times the amount that I was making at the time because I was、mm-hmm. fresh out of college. And he's like. How would you like to have double your salary? And by having double the salary, they, DoubleClick would end up saving like over half the money. So, you know, it was kind of a, a perfect example where there was a quote unquote you know intermediary in the market, which is a consulting、mm-hmm. firm, and they were they were charging four or five x 
kind of what my salary was and both sides ended up benefiting from it besides necessarily the consulting firm. Mm -hmm. So after I was there for a couple of years before I went to, went to Warren for business school Mm -hmm. and, um, the nature of my job is that I had a lot of opportunity to build relationships with people on, li- on the leadership team of DoubleClick. Um, because when you're dealing with succession planning, you're figuring out who the successors are for key positions. You have a lot of like those kind of meaningful conversations. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the key for someone to find a mentor mm-hmm. is finding someone who you actually are able to have a personal chemistry with. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a lot easier to have an ongoing relationship if it's not just about like, oh, this person's really senior. Um, This person can advance my career. Mm -hmm. There needs to be something more than that. Mm -hmm. Whether it's, you know, that you you both have similar backgrounds or you have an appreciation for music or for Mm -hmm. art or for history, whatever the the topic Mm -hmm. happens to be, a personal relationship is actually pretty critical in an ongoing Mm -hmm. mentoring type, type, type dynamic. That's number one. Um, the second thing I would say is that when, when you're working, when you're trying to find a mentor, it's actually okay to say to someone, as awkward as this sounds, mm-hmm. I would like for you to be my mentor. I would like to learn from mm-hmm. you. Would you be open to talking every three months, every six months, mm-hmm. whatever the time period may be? Mm-hmm. Um, people, like, you're, you're putting yourself out there. Yeah. And it's like a vulnerable position to do to say like, I would like you to be my mentor. Mm-hmm. I would like to learn from you. Mm-hmm. But if you don't ask, you don't get. So I've had people come to me and say like, hey, would you be open just talking once every six months or once every three months for half an hour, for an hour? And, and then we could talk in between if there's something big going on. I'm like, sure, mm-hmm. happy to help you. I think generally the thing that people tend to like doing in senior positions hopefully people like doing this is helping younger people and helping Mm -hmm. and being able to give advice. I mean, everyone loves giving advice. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's what mentors ultimately do. So I would just say that Kevin has been a mentor for 23 years. There's another person who is the CEO of DoubleClick named David Rosenblatt, who Mm -hmm. was a super close mentor. I probably haven't had six months in the last 20 plus years where I haven't spoken to, spoken to him. And sometimes we could speak three or four times in a week if I'm, you know, mm-hmm. looking about job stuff or mm-hmm. other career major issues. And sometimes it might be six months or nine months between, you know, we get together in person. But it's one of the most fulfilling things to be able to have someone like Kevin Ryan or like David Rosenblatt, mm-hmm. um, who is totally unbiased and is just there to like mm-hmm. help to make you successful. That's really cool that you find these people really early on through work, right? So in terms of like having these kind of mentorship going on, like I'm sure like a lot of our audience are entrepreneurs. So they probably didn't really have a long time work experience with a particular really successful person. How should they kind of approach these kind of mentorship? Do they just cold reach out on LinkedIn or how would you go about it if you're us? Yeah, I definitely wouldn't use LinkedIn because <laughs> it's, it's not personal enough. Mm-hmm. If you're going to use LinkedIn, mm-hmm. then you have to write a particularly compelling message. <laughs> like I have had people reach out to me from, okay, the typical message from LinkedIn is, I see you're CEO of blank company, which they just fill in the name. Yeah. And you've had an amazing career without any details. Would you be open to talking so I could learn more about your amazing career? And it's like, they put no time into it. I've had other emails that have said things like, I just watched a video from a podcast from Grace Gang. I just saw this other video that you were in. Uh, I talked to this person that happens to know you. And the thing that struck me the most was X, Y, Z. Would you be open to chatting for 15 minutes? Like, if you're going to use LinkedIn, find a way to send a personal email rather than a message through LinkedIn because emails mm-hmm. tend to work better than messages. Mm-hmm. And make sure it's like, not just like personalized, but like there's a real reason why you want to have the conversation. Mm-hmm. And and I've done that. I, I've had lots of people do that. And I would say mm-hmm. when when people really make an effort, my time's not that valuable. So is my time worth 15 or 20 minutes to help someone else? Of course it is. So, you know, I think it's worthwhile to do it. Um, 
and just make it make show that you put the time into really learning as much as you can about a person. So LinkedIn can be decent for that. But mm-hmm. I think a better thing is using LinkedIn to see who your contacts are potentially in common mm-hmm. and asking for common contact to make an introduction. Mm-hmm. That oftentimes is more effective. So mm-hmm. still using LinkedIn, but not using LinkedIn to message the person, mm-hmm. but using LinkedIn to see who you have in common, to see who you could change the go-to. The mm-hmm. other thing is, um, well, I'm the CEO of this company called Meetup. <laughs> and by the way, at Meetup, we happen to have like, we have 330,000 groups and our biggest group are tech groups, but tens of thousands of groups for entrepreneurs. We've had literally thousands of people meet, meet, meet co-partners, hire employees, figure out who could be on the management team all because of Meetup. So I, even if I wasn't the CEO of Meetup, I would say that if you find a Meetup, which mm-hmm. there are thousands of, especially in the Bay Area, but all around mm-hmm. the country, around the world, that has to do with entrepreneurship. Mm-hmm. Go to that group and try to build relations with other entrepreneurs, try to move relations with other, other you know, venture capital, private equity individuals. And then you have a personal relationship. You're doing it in person. And mm-hmm. when you're able to have a conversation in person, which, thank God, in certain parts of the country, like New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, we're able to do more in person. And hopefully in a month or two in California, Texas, Arizona, we'll be able to do more in person. Mm -hmm. Um, But I would say Meetup is also a great vehicle for meeting other entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And just, you know, make sure you stand out in what you're trying to do. Last Mm -hmm. story I'll tell you on this particular question is there's a Meetup um, organizer. And he was Mm -hmm. telling me that he has two different meet groups. Mm -hmm. One is a career network and meetup group to help to find a job. Mm -hmm. The second one was a bowling meetup group because he just loves bowling. Mm-hmm. So of course, how does it work? He ends up find he ended up finding his last two jobs mm-hmm. from his bowling meetup group. Yeah. So That's my so point fun. there is, mm-hmm. is that you can build mentoring relationships not in career networking business settings, mm-hmm. sometimes more effectively mm-hmm. than in career networking business set settings. Mm-hmm. I totally agree with you to create some sort of common interest. So you can you have something that's other than work to talk about. So you don't have to be like, hey, I'm going to do this thing for you. And then you are supposed to, you know, return the favor or something. Exactly. I definitely agree with work, you. Yeah. Foundation of personal relationships, mm-hmm. foundation of finding things in common with mm-hmm. each other, foundation of people. Because ultimately, mentoring oftentimes is a somewhat philanthropic type activity where you're just trying mm-hmm. to help someone. And it's mm-hmm. not like a quid pro quo type thing. Mm-hmm. So, so you need someone to try to, that will, that will want to go above and beyond, which does have to do with a personal relationship. Mm-hmm. I think you really brought up a really good point on there. So I'm going to, yeah, uh, take notes. Yeah, like totally. So in terms of like forming these kind of mentorship positions, so have there's, do you have any mentees that, you know, you had a successful experience or like a meaningful relationship with? How, how did they find you? And then what did they do that's right for in this situation to, you know, get your attention and then like, you know, having this kind of relationship with them? I probably have had a hundred plus conversations mm-hmm. with different people, let's say in their twenties or earlier in their career, um, around what they should do and mm-hmm. career advice and things like that. But I wouldn't consider that necessarily effective mentoring relationship because it's really just a one-time or a two-time type conversation. What mm-hmm. I think people don't do well frequently, and some do, mm-hmm. is to reach out six months later, to reach out a year later, mm-hmm. reach out two years later, reach out three years later. So I'm also a professor at Columbia and I teach entrepreneurship at Columbia. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting to me, you know, sometimes I'll have a student that I'll have had two years prior. Mm-hmm. And right after the class, let's say they reached out, we went for a breakfast together. And then two mm-hmm. years later, they reach out again and be like, you know, I just wanted to tell you how I'm doing, get your mm-hmm. advice on this other thing. And that's wonderful. But very few people will do the follow-up one a year, two, three years later, because mm-hmm. you just haven't, hadn't thought about it or whatever. So I would say the key to a successful mentoring relationship is for it to be ongoing. Mm-hmm. Like if it's a one-time thing or even a two-time thing, it's not ongoing. For mm-hmm. a person to periodically be like, hey, I'm going through something, really need your quick advice. Would you be able to hop on the phone in the next day or two so that, mm-hmm. I, so, so that you, so I could, so you could help me think, think, think through this? Mm-hmm. 
that's 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 like the, the best type of relationship. Mm-hmm. So I would say people tend to the people that tend to do things well are the ones that say, "Hey, would you be okay with like I mentioned earlier, if every six months we tried to get together?" And I'm mm-hmm. not going to say no typically. I'll be like, "Sure," and then maybe a quarter of the time they follow up. And then when they do, it leads to like long-standing kind of relationships. So there's someone that I've been mentoring, quote unquote, um, for close to ten years, mm-hmm. and he's this particular person. He's been moving up um, from a job perspective, and I think the the mark of a successful one is is that on occasion he'll just call me up and say, "Hey, can I just get your advice about this really important thing? Because I need to figure it out, and I need I, need, I could use you as a sounding board." Mm-hmm. And and he, I've also used him as a sounding board, mm-hmm. and then it, that's a beautiful thing when when mm-hmm. kind of a one sided relationship turns into like I mentioned earlier, kind of a two sided relationship, mm-hmm. um, and both people can really help each other out. That makes it a lot more sustainable than mm-hmm. just kind of always giving or one side always taking and one side always giving. I mean, mm-hmm. ideally, it should be a give and take, ideally type relationship for to sustain. And sustainability is the most important component to like mm-hmm. a good mentoring type relationship. I totally agree with you. It should go both ways instead of just one person having a lot of input on someone else. So yeah, I, so, I'll tell you, like there, mm-hmm. there's there's a there's a person on my team. This is now his third company that has worked for me. And there's another person mm-hmm. that also has worked for me for three different companies. Mm-hmm. And I think when you have that type of continuity, it, it makes for I think every, everyone benefits. Yeah, I like that you have people that follow you too. You know, three different jobs. That's、uh, that's crazy to hear now, especially you know now like in the the younger generation are so easy to to switch into a different sector now and then. So going back to your career, so you worked as a consultant, and then what kind of things did you learn there? So a lot of people in、uh, currently are going through the consulting phase. Like, what did you kind of like leverage your position there to kind of make the most out of it?、And And basically, like a lot of people having the same consulting experience in the past, like how did you stand out from your peers? Yeah. So start with this. I am really not a fan of consulting. <laughs> <laughs>、um, I think consultants, being a consultant, can be very helpful in building the early stages of a career.、Mm-hmm. But staying in consulting. And constantly just advising companies versus like owning and doing,、mm-hmm. um, doesn't necessarily make someone more successful when they look to be a to actually move into a company.、Mm-hmm. And if someone wants to be a lifelong consultant, sure. For me, I didn't find it personally gratifying. I felt like I was creating at the time binders or decks or whatever,、mm-hmm. sharing them, passing them on. Maybe they implement them, maybe they're not. But I felt like so much about consulting was trying to get the next consulting gig, as opposed to like really help clients, which、mm-hmm. did not make me feel good inside.、Mm-hmm. So I did consulting for a couple of years and never looked back. And I did a summer internship during business school, and that was that.、Mm-hmm. Um, but I would say the best part of consulting is selfish, as bad as that sounds. The first is that you get exposure to different industries.、Mm-hmm. You get exposure to Um, different types of job functions,、mm-hmm. and it's like an ongoing education after college. Like I was a liberal arts major in college. I majored、mm-hmm. in philosophy, political science, and economics.、Mm-hmm. And God, I didn't know what I wanted to do.、Um, so consulting was like a further education for me to learn more、mm-hmm. about about business.、So、that's one benefit. Again, this is all like the benefit is very selfish for the person. The second benefit is you build a lot of relationships in consulting、mm-hmm. potentially. And like the example that I gave, I got my kind of big job in tech, my first job in tech, because I was consulting and they were a client.、Mm-hmm. So I guess what I would say is use consulting to give oneself a myriad of different experiences so you can learn as much as you can. If you're doing some consulting gig and you're working for, you know, whatever, a year, two years, more. <laughs> Fly here, year two years more. Actually, it's more than a fly. It's like a gigantic bee.、Oh、um, and, and you're on the same exact project, and you're not learning new things. Then th- you miss out on that entire consulting learning opportunity.、Mm-hmm. Um, and if you're in the back, like if you're like in the back office, and you're not getting exposure to clients, you're not meeting lots of people. You're missing、mm-hmm. out on a major value of consulting, which is. The ability to build relationships with clients to potentially help you to find, you know, your next job.
mm-hmm. or, or so. So I, I strongly encourage anyone who's in consulting to try to be as client facing as possible, mm-hmm. building relationships as possible. And the way that, like you asked, how do you stand out? Mm-hmm. I don't think you stand out in your resume. Again, take it back to the first question. I think you stand out in your relationships that you're able to build. Mm -hmm. So try to parlay consulting into relationships that can open up different future job opportunities for yourself, Mm -hmm. as opposed to like turning them into nice bullet points on your resume Mm -hmm. that are not actually going to stand out in any way, shape or form from the Mm -hmm. tens of thousands of other people who are in consulting. You Mm -hmm. want to stand out? Build relationships. That's my answer. I really love that piece. I feel like relationship is definitely super important in business. Speaking of that, like I know that you eventually landed a, a job at Dwayne Reed after Double Click. So tell us more about like you know when you like how do you land that position, and then when you get in, you created this uh, DR Express. Tell us more about you know what do you see in this company, and how do you kind of strategize to change the organization for for good. Okay, so this is a maybe a fun story. So the opposite of cons- consulting in my mind is like you're very hands off. Mm-hmm. You're not getting your fingernails dirty. Mm-hmm. You're not like rolling up your sleeves, quote unquote, and like mm-hmm. getting involved in things. Mm-hmm. So I decided that I wanted to do the exact opposite of consulting, which was retail, actually mm-hmm. dealing with physical stores. Mm-hmm. Dwayne Reed is a large pharmacy chain in the New York metro area, similar mm-hmm. to Long's in the West Coast or Walgreens, ultimately was acquired by Walgreens like 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. And, um, While I was in business school, I had this epiphany that the job that I wanted to have was called an assistant to the CEO job, Mm -hmm. where like you help the CEO with board decks and strategy and like an internal consultant or something, Mm -hmm. but you're working directly with the CEO because the CEO could then be your mentor. Mm -hmm. And I wanted this like to be an assistant to the CEO. Mm -hmm. So I reached out to like... 30, 40 different companies and told them I want to be assistant CEO. I ended up with like, having 10 different conversations mm-hmm. with the CEO of 100 Flowers, CEO of Monster, CEO of the NBA commissioner at the time, and a bunch of different companies about being assistant to the CEO. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, ultimately, when I graduated from business school, I could only get jobs because it was a tough time. I got four job offers and all four were in consulting. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I don't believe this. But then I ended up... Um, and I accepted a job at Boston Consulting Group, actually. Mm-hmm. And then they gave me a start date that was eight months after we graduated from business school. So we graduated mm-hmm. in May, mm-hmm. and it was like in January, February the following year because mm-hmm. the economy wasn't good. So I'm like, what the heck am I supposed to do for the next eight months? So I went back to um, an, a company. I said, okay, Dwayne Reed, you won't hire me, but can I just spend six months being like an assistant to the CEO mm-hmm. you know, for six months as a, as a six-month intern? Mm-hmm. And I just kind of created a new job, and then I did that. And um, at the end of six months, they were like, "Okay, we don't want you to leave. We want you to stay." Mm-hmm. And then I called up BCG, and I, and I said, "I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to go to BCG." Mm-hmm. And they're like, "What? How could you do that? How could you leave BCG? It's you know, we're you're never going to work in consulting again. You're you're gone to consulting." And I, and then I said, "He said, where are you going?" So I said, um, I'm going to be running business development for a $2 billion pharmacy chain. Mm -hmm. Then there was a long pause. And then he says, do you think you feel bad enough that you'd be willing to give us some business? (laughs) That's so fun. Yeah. Did you though? No. Yeah. (laughs) Not after you just spent time yelling at me about stuff. (laughs) Um, Yeah. So that's how I ended up at Dwayne Reed and, uh, Coincidentally, I ended up getting another another job also similar to that, but I'm not going to go into that. I love that. So it sounds like you're super entrepreneurial. How was a so you mentioned that you basically like uh, reach out to for like 30, 40 companies. Did you create a, a list? Like what kind of company were you shooting for? <laughs> and like, okay, so you, you want email, the details? Yeah, I want details. Do you email <laughs> okay, so them like, or standing in front of their office to be like, hey, yeah. here's so me. this is a long time ago. Phenomenal guy. This is 2002. Mm-hmm. I was I was graduated business school in 2003. So in 2002, there was this data resource called OneSource, where it listed the um, the names of all of the executives and leaders in a company. And you could probably find that in Hoover's or some other 
resource now. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm sure there's lots of places you go online to find the names. LinkedIn, wherever. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and what I did is <laughs> I wanted to go to like work for Major League Baseball or the NBA or Dwayne Reed or Orange Flowers mm-hmm. or Jeff Blue, all these places. And I knew that a warm introduction would be more successful than a cold introduction, right? Mm-hmm. So I found the top 50, impl- 50 people, like all vice presidents and above mm-hmm. in these 30 companies. And then I looked online to find out whether the derivation of the emails, David dot Siegel, David underscore Siegel, D Siegel, mm-hmm. you know, David at whatever the derivation is of an email address. And then I figured it out. So then I created a spreadsheet mm-hmm. of the top 50 executives at like 30 mm-hmm. companies. You're talking about 1500 people. And then what their email addresses were. And then in one night, I just decided to stay up all night long and copy paste an email, <laughs> individual email to all 1,500 of those individuals. And, and, then, and then what would happen is I, like some VP of facilities would be like, mm-hmm. why are you emailing me? The right person to email is so-and-so, mm-hmm. is, is Janice. So then, I emailed, so then I would email Janice and say, hey, Janice, Ralph told me I should follow up with you. Oh my God, that's so smart. It's uh, and what, everything that I said there was totally mm-hmm. true because Ralph did tell me I should follow with Janice. Mm-hmm. Now I didn't say I knew Ralph, but but mm-hmm. Ralph, but 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 um, Ralph told me I should follow with Janice. So then I was able to parlay all those and well, and then Janice was like, "Well, if Ralph told you to follow up with me, then sure, let's chat." <laughs> In terms of like writing these emails, as you mentioned previously, don't use a generic, hi, blah, I saw you work at blah. So what do you write in these emails? Right, right. So so you wrote that, so basically. Here's the answer. This was, first of all, a long, long time ago, mm-hmm. when I don't think people sent quite as many personal emails back then. Mm-hmm. And and I did volume over quality. Mm-hmm. And and the volume did lead to... Did lead to um, a whole host of conversations. Mm-hmm. The subject line I find is the best subject line um, is actually a very simple one, which is just um, chat explanation, uh, chat question mark. When you put <laughs> it as a question, mm-hmm. then they don't know what it's necessary about. It could be mm-hmm. something important. It could be not. So because they see chat question mark, they're more open to reading it because it's a question. They, People see a question and their natural inclination psychologically is then to want to answer the question. Mm-hmm. So they, they'll open it up to see what it's about. And then I basically would say, uh, would, 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 would say, I'm interested in being, I don't remember the exact words, but it was very mm-hmm. short. I think a general best practice is it should fit in the auto preview section of, of an email so you could mm-hmm. see it like super efficiently. It's not like a long thing. Mm-hmm. My resume wasn't attached. It wasn't anything. It was just like, and always ending with a question. Mm-hmm. Who were the best? Can, can, no, it was, can I follow up with your assistant to set up a follow-up meeting? Mm-hmm. I knew lots of people had an assistant. So it made, I want to make it very easy. So, that, so a lot of times people would just reply the back, reply, and they follow, and they see their assistant. Mm-hmm. If I said, do you want to meet? They probably want to reply back. So I gave them like a very direct suggestion. Mm-hmm. Can you please like CC your assistant so that we can now chat? And sometimes just quickly, people will just be like, oh, okay, yeah, I'll see my assistant. (laughs) So when you chatted with a bunch of people like this, and then what was the conversation with Dwayne Reed? So how did you, did you chat with the CEO directly? Did you uh, chat with someone that works for him? How how does that work? Yeah, okay. So let's take Dwayne Reed. It was after business school. Um, So for Dwayne Reed's case, I was able to get in, I didn't care who I got in front of, Mm -hmm. you know, I just want to get in front of someone. So I was able to get in front of the CFO mm-hmm. because the CFO happened to have gone to Warden, mm-hmm. which is the school that I was in. Mm-hmm. And I think they were more inclined to answer, to reply back because of, it was his alma mater. I didn't even know that at the time. Mm-hmm. So I got in front of him and then he put me in touch with the head of HR for the company. And then mm-hmm. I met with the head of HR in person because in person is always more productive than a phone call. Mm-hmm. And anytime people were like, oh, let's set up a call. I'd be like, actually, I'm going to be in New York next week. Why don't we meet in person? Like, okay, I better get into New York now. Um, and then I met with the head of HR. And then and then I pitched him on the on a, creating a new job as opposed to just like, mm-hmm. you know, like, so what jobs do you have open? Who cares what jobs you have open? It's not important jobs they have open. It's important, like, you need to create your job, create your role, um, and pitch it. And, mm-hmm. and then I met with the CEO because I pitched a job. 
And, and then the CEO ultimately um, said, no, we will not hire you. But then I went back and I turned it into an internship. And mm-hmm. I said, hey, you have nothing to lose. Just hire me as an intern. And then they said, yes. Did they pay you at the beginning or do you work for free? Yeah, yeah no, it was a paid internship. Nice. Oh my God. Good, good for you. That's amazing. Yeah. I <laughs> well, like here's that. an even better one, Grace. You're going to love this one. This will be really quick. So three years later when I was at Dwayne Reed, mm-hmm. I get an email from a friend and it says, it says, uh, David, look, there's a job posting on, on Warden's alumni database. And I was like, what is it? So I looked on Warden's alumni database and it said, 1-800-Flowers CEO Mm-hmm. looking for an assistant to the CEO. Wow. And I was like, oh my God, three years ago, I talked to the CEO of 1-800-Flowers, Jim McCann, mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. try to convince him to hire me when I was at Warren. Like, there was one of the companies on my list. <laughs> and I talked to him for 15 minutes, for like 20 minutes. It was like an amazing conversation. Mm-hmm. And he ultimately said no. So I then sent him an email and I said, hey, I don't know if you remember me, but three years ago, we had a conversation about you being that being you about about me being an assistant to the CEO. If in any way that led to you posting something uh, mm-hmm. on, on on Warden and creating that job, that's so cool. We should get together. So he just emailed me back five words. I swear, His five words were, "I was looking for you." Oh my god! Wow, that's <laughs> amazing. It comes. So you never know circle. what's going to happen. Yeah. Oh my God. I feel like that's uh that's just like really highlights like these kind of relationships you have to create and go after for yourself. And I love that. I love how creative you are. Like, I mean, how do you learn these kind of things or it just come out of nowhere or do you read them in a novo or like how, how do you create these kind of like solution <laughs> for yourself? <laughs> I don't know. I think it's not like you learn things from other people. I mean, yes, you do generally, but I think, mm-hmm. I think generally the more fearful someone is, the more that they're going to go down the standard path, mm-hmm. the more, the less fearful someone is, the more you're willing to put yourself out there. Mm-hmm. You're willing to fail. You're mm-hmm. willing to be vulnerable. Mm-hmm. You're willing to look stupid. You're willing to put yourself in a position where you don't really know anything. You're going to learn it on the spot. Mm-hmm. And I think that, you know, like we started in the beginning, like a lot does come down to parenting. And if mm-hmm. you're, build confidence with a child, hopefully not cockiness, but confidence, Mm -hmm. then you feel that you're able to put yourself out there Mm -hmm. and take an alternative path to the same path that everyone else takes. Mm -hmm. And while everyone else is like, I'm going to do consulting for 10 years or invest in banking and kill myself for three years and do this and then do that for three years or this Mm -hmm. for three years. Um, You know, instead it's like, hey, I have very little to lose. Mm-hmm. So you might as well try it. And it's just kind of, it's a mentality thing, I think, more than anything. And I think mm-hmm. the mentality is n- it never hurts to try. Be persistent, mm-hmm. but not annoying, obviously. And and um, try to create as many options for yourself as you can. Mm-hmm. And then good things will happen by creating options for yourself. For sure. Um, but I think one of the things that like we haven't talked about is, you know, you went to Wharton, you, you know, you were this guy who work at, you know, top consulting firm or like at least got a, a job offer at BCG. So curious on, you know, how much is like the self-education or like how much is like because of your good and then you have this confidence to go after whatever this is or you know, like when the right. when the CEO of like Dwayne Reed or or like Eight Hundred Flowers, when they were seeing your resume, they know that you can kind of like do this job. Like, but yeah, I my think- resume was crap. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, honestly, the resume doesn't mean anything. Mm-hmm. It means very little. Mm-hmm. So much about figuring out how to get your foot in the door. I think that. I was probably below average in terms of my warden class in terms of like sheer intelligence or whatever, like, or average, let's say. I I think, I think you stand out by, I think I was good at trying to build relationships with people, Mm -hmm. but it wasn't because I had this like larger goal, honestly, it was because I just genuinely like people. I like Mm -hmm. learning from people. I like, I'm curious. I like, I have a, a lot of different areas of 
life that I'm interested in. Mm-hmm. And I, I like, um, I love people. And mm-hmm. I think it's, it's, I guess you can't teach that. And I, I don't think it's about intelligence or resume or anything else like that. I think, mm-hmm. I think being able to be genuinely curious and interested in another person, not fake, mm-hmm. but genuinely interested in another person um, is, a, is, is a key component to ultimately being successful mm-hmm. and yeah. caring. I want them to succeed. Thank you so much for sharing. This is such a really, it's such a really interesting story. And then I feel like it's a, it's a really actually doable story. You make, you make it sounds really doable. So I feel like it's doable. You don't have to kill yourself. You don't work crazy hours. You don't have to go to the top schools. You know, you just have to um, be willing to put yourself out there. Mm -hmm. Just like you're doing grace. Be willing to relationships with people that you may not deserve quote unquote on paper to have a relationship with who says you don't you're as special as anyone else not just you but anyone who's listening is as special as anyone else Mm -hmm. probably even more special and you have to feel like other people have just as much that they can learn from you as as you from them Mm -hmm. and uh anyone can do that I would say that there's a great book, and if you haven't read it, then you should, Grace. But if not, then read it. But other people should read it, too. And it's one of the best business books out there, um, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Oh, my God. Um, I love that book. Yeah. It's Dale a great Carnegie. book. Yeah. Yeah, Dale Carnegie. And there are some things in the book that are really old school. And frankly, it's a mm-hmm. serious problem. It's not really. A, it's a problem for today's age that there's not ex- enough, any examples, frankly, of women or, or, or uh, people of color that are mm-hmm. in the book, um, understanding that the lens of when it was written was the 1920s, when mm-hmm. unfortunately the world was in a much worse place. There's so much that can be learned from the book. It's required reading in my class, for example. Um, and I think it's an important business book. Um, and, and I think it helps people to really understand how to ultimately be, far, be more successful. Anyone Absolutely. Could do it. Thank you so much for sharing with us and being so like yeah. open about this. So in terms of after you got to Dwayne Reed, so I know that you created this uh, DR Express and then there are a lot of really cool new strategies, you know, within this like three years that you, when you were working there, tell us more about like, you know, what do you see as a company's like growth potential and how do you kind of implement this into the company? Also, you had like negotiate deals with, uh, you know, Citigroup, Viacom and Time Warner and all these like top companies. I'm sure like you're, as you mentioned previously, you had emailed all these CEOs in the past, but how do you kind of create a deal for, for, for doing read? And having a first conversation is really important, but actually turning the conversation into a partnership or something that's like yeah. business related, it's like a different thing. So tell us more about how, how you created these uh, opportunities. I mean, to me, everything comes from, as an entrepreneur, and everyone's an entrepreneur, right? <laughs> Every person as an entrepreneur, um, especially when it comes to their careers. Mm-hmm. Um, but as an entrepreneur, every you have to find the pain point. You have to find mm-hmm. like the key problem. Mm-hmm. And if you if you if everything that you do is um, a result of understanding a key pain point that people have, that people acknowledge as a pain point, mm-hmm. the good things come out of that. Um, so specifically at Dwayne Reed which was again like 17 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, but at Dwayne Reed, there was a big pain point in the pharmacy industry where people would mm-hmm. go, to the, go to the pharmacy, drop off the script, have to wait around for an hour, pick, uh, wait around, you know, then go back again, pick up the script. It was just very inefficient. Mm-hmm. So the CEO, CEO and I came up with really an idea where, which is, again, this is 17 years ago, where mm-hmm. we would have a kiosk. We, you would be able to video conference with a pharmacist 24-7 mm-hmm. Um, and you'd be able to scan your, your, your prescription. And then by the time you got to one of our stores, it was automatically immediately ready for you, mm-hmm. um, for pickup. So it saved a lot of time and they didn't have mm-hmm. other, other, other ways of doing things back then. So mm-hmm. the, the bottom line is that's an example where there's a, a pain point. People hated it. So we developed this thing and we put them in hundreds of hospitals and senior living facilities and, and, and companies. And we had tens of thousands like millions of dollars going through mm-hmm. something called Dwayne Reed Express kiosks, which mm-hmm. again was an interesting technology mm-hmm. for its time a long time ago. Mm-hmm. Um, but it started with having a pain point. 
And the same thing goes with when you're trying to get clients or do business development deals, figure out what the pain point is. Don't just try to shove your solution in. Don't try to shove your company in. Mm -hmm. But everything needs to be framed in, okay, what is the pain that you are going through right now? And how could my solution be a, be be a, be help you with your with the current pain point that you happen to have as a company? Mm-hmm. And that's it. And if um, and if you could make a match between the pain point of an individual or the pain point of a company and your solution, you got to win. And if not, you say, you know what? This doesn't sound like we could really help you here. But if we ever are able to create something that could help you, we'll let you know. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. And so frame everything in terms of problem solution orientation. So finding out like the pain point and then figuring out like how your service or how you can fix a problem. I love that. So, you know, like back in time, so you built this, you built this like strategic strategic partnerships with, uh, you know, Citigroup, Biocom or Time Warner. What do you see as their pain? And then how did like doing read solve them? So it it varied because it's about storytelling. So you need to figure Mm -hmm. out what's the pain point story. Mm -hmm. And how could your solution help them? So for example, if it's a senior living facility, the pain point is that if you're a senior, it's much harder for you um, because you're less mobile mobile, to go to a pharmacy, wait on, wait at the pharmacy and come back. But if you have a, a, a kiosk at your facility and you go and use the kiosk, we have someone help you to teach you how to use the kiosk. And then we deliver it back to the facility and it's a huge win for residents. So we would sell it to, not sell it to, we gave it free actually mm-hmm. to the owner of the senior living facility. And then they would have all their patients, all their residents actually use it. And then we had a huge growth in number of subscriptions and purchases on Dwayne Reed because it was a big Dwayne Reed kiosk mm-hmm. kind of, that was you know, like an airline kiosk. It was, there's no mm-hmm. person there um, at, at the location. So the sell point for the owner of the facility was we can make the life Make, we can make the lives of your residents, of your seniors, senior residents easier mm-hmm. at no cost to you. You can, no cost to me. Great, let's do it. Mm-hmm. If you're a hospital and you know that over half of the subscriptions that you write end up not getting filled, mm-hmm. then we could go to a hospital administrator and say, we can increase the compliance rate of people who get subscription, prescriptions, excuse me. We have prescriptions. Mm-hmm. Um, from people who get discharged out of your emergency room by making mm-hmm. it much easier for people who get discharged to mm-hmm. get their first first uh, prescriptions. Mm-hmm. You can increase compliance rates so that people don't end up coming back to the emergency rooms, mm-hmm. which ultimately then saves me money. How much does that cost? Nothing. Okay, let's do it. So, you know, it's about like figuring out what the story is to address the pain point for each mm-hmm. of the different, went to heads of HR for companies we could create a special service for your employees that no other com- that no, no other companies have and your competitors don't have. So your employees mm-hmm. um, can appreciate being being an employee at Viacom even more um, mm-hmm. uh, because you're providing an easy way for them to get um, prescriptions and, and, and go to the pharmacy. You could do that. What does it cost? Mm-hmm. Nothing. So again, same exact mm-hmm. thing. Yeah, Pain absolutely. Point. Solution. And, and no cost. Uh, no cost, so yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that piece. So then, you know, like after after the, your success at Dwayne Reed, and then there's, uh, you know, 800 Flowers, and then you, you started your career in Seeking Alpha and Investopedia. By the way, my favorite is Investopedia, just because I feel like for every interview I do, or like just like for pa- in the past, like I was on job interviews, like I feel like I use Investopedia almost every day on searching something new. Um, awesome. So, it's a great mm-hmm. mission in Investopedia. It's the world's fi- largest financial education kind of business. Mm-hmm. And Investopedia has educated like hundreds of millions of people around finance. So it's, it, yeah. was a, it was a fun yeah. time to run the company. Mm-hmm. Curious on, you know, like in those two companies, you kind of created. So for, I know that for Investopedia, you grow from the, you grow the team from like 26 people to 150 people. So you basically fire the past, like exactly the team. Tell us more about like, you know, what do you see in this company that, you know, was the opportunity for you to change it? And how do you kind of, what was the conversation like to fire the existing people? And like, what kind of people do you bring on board? To, to change the data. Yeah, I mean, I think and it's, it, that was an that was more of an evolution than a revolution in Investopedia. Mm-hmm. Um, Investopedia was always like a terms company where it's just kind of a dictionary of finance. Mm-hmm. And we wanted to figure out how can we turn like a financial dictionary into something mm-hmm. much, much bigger. Mm-hmm. So we created all these alternative um, 
business areas like um, a certification. It's created something called Investopedia Academy where you get a certification and, mm-hmm. and learn all these new courses, just like Udemy, Udacity, or Khan Academy. Mm-hmm. Um, we started investing in news um, so that people can learn more in the context of what's happening today and just kind of stuff that had been written you know, five, 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, but ultimately, for Investopedia, it was more, this is a company that ranks high in everything that it ever published is. Um, let's analyze the results of how much we need to spend to publish something mm-hmm. and what the return on that spend is. And we ended up figuring out that if we 10x the amount that we published, every time we publish something, it's very profitable. Mm-hmm. So let's just publish uh, 10x more. And mm-hmm. we published a lot more. And we published a lot of really quality articles that have a tremendous amount of traffic, which mm-hmm. then turned into a lot of traffic and revenue growth for the company. So we just were able to figure out how to kind of scale the business very cost effectively. Mm-hmm. In terms of the personnel, um, you know, some of the leaders have been with the company for five or 10 years prior. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and sometimes there's a malaise and a, a more laid back attitude that exists when you've been in a company for a long time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, nothing against those individuals. They, some of them were exceptional. And had they not been in Investopedia, they would have ended up being more successful because they could like think differently. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it just requires saying, you know, you did an amazing job. Um, start looking for something else. We want to bring in some different thinking, you know, to kind of bring us to the, the next one. And that's what we mostly did in Investopedia. Yeah, absolutely. I, I I love that you are also thinking for them to, you know, if they leave Investopedia, if they go into somewhere else, may, maybe they will be more successful. I like that way of thinking. Yeah, it happens it's, very frequently. Very yeah, frequently. Absolutely. I, I definitely feel like, you know, any organization kind of needs a kind of motivation to, to jump out of the old box to thinking outside of the box. I, I, I love that. In terms of like monetizing a website, I think you did a really good job in both Investopedia, Seeking Alpha, and right now like at Meetup. So tell us more about like, you know, when you get into a company, it's it either could be like Investopedia or Meetup. So when you get into the company, how do you quickly realize like what kind of things would help them to monetize on their existing platform and tell us more about like you know when you get into the company what is it like and then how did you came up with the strategy to kind of make them to get on the next level yeah, i mean there's no one size of all i think some companies have mm-hmm. only one um revenue stream mm-hmm. and you need to look at the company and be like is that the right revenue stream or are there multiple different revenue streams that could be better mm-hmm. so in the case of Investopedia, um, the company was really just an ad supported site and we mm-hmm. added on a subscription site in the e-commerce business, the lead gen business, and we grew revenue by actually adding on an addition, additional mm-hmm. kind of business areas. Whereas at Meetup, the company had been doing a whole lot of different things mm-hmm. and almost too many different things and was kind mm-hmm. of a little bit all over the place. And we said, we're doing too many different things when I came in and we actually decreased the number of things that we we're focused on. Mm-hmm. And so we need to have more focus. And by having more focus, we're ultimately going to be more successful. Mm-hmm. And we shut down a bunch of different kind of initiatives and, and that the company was focused on mm-hmm. so that we can um, so we can ultimately do a better job in, in kind of what our core is, which is helping to build communities mm-hmm. and, and have amazing events in those communities. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a lot of distractions that was going on at, at Meetup. Mm-hmm. So I think it's, the, the key is like, there's no, again, panacea, there's no like one way thing, but you should, mm-hmm. but it's important for a CEO who comes in to come in and look at what's happening in a company and are they quote unquote sleepy and just mm-hmm. been doing the same thing forever, which is Investopedia mm-hmm. and there's opportunities for different things, or are they kind of overly ambitious and doing a lot of different things, but not doing like an amazing job at any one of them? which was actually the case in Meetup where you need to kind of focus the business more. And so it's different approaches on the, on the situation. For but a lot sure. has to do with sure. like whether you need to defocus or defocus or increase focus. When you go into this company, like what were, describe the first week, like when you got into Meetup or Investopedia, do, were yeah. you just like trying to read all the balance sheet or like do you talk to everybody in this company? Yeah. How do you do it? I remember when I had my first day at Meetup, mm-hmm. I had like, you know, I stood up in front of 250 people and they were like, tell us the strategy of the company, David. And I was like, I have no idea. Like, mm-hmm. this is my day one. 
Mm-hmm. We're going to build a process to figure out what the strategy is. Mm-hmm. And you're going to be a big part of figuring out that strategy. So we, we, I put out seven big strategic questions. Mm-hmm. Um, for example, what are we doing that we should stop doing? You know, mm-hmm. um, and other questions. And we then put together a work group, working groups of like 10 people for each of those questions. Mm-hmm. And then we put very aggressive timelines of what needs to be accomplished and templates by each of the work groups. Mm-hmm. And then we made some very important strategic decisions, but we did it in an empowered way. We did it collaboratively. And then mm-hmm. as opposed to me just like dictating things, because what the heck do I know? I just started. Mm-hmm. The job is to be, you know, the orchestra leader mm-hmm. and to help people to figure out how to prioritize the things that are most important, but not to like dictate that in any way. I have three questions for you. So one is, okay. uh, what's your favorite book? And the other one is, uh, who would you invite to your dinner party? And uh, the third one is like, who made the biggest impact in your career? Wow. Or life? Yeah. Okay. Favorite book. So I already talked about uh, how to win friends and influence people. So that's probably mm-hmm. my favorite business book. Mm-hmm. My favorite non-business book is the book by James Mitchell called The Source which is about um, Israeli archaeologists and just absolutely amazing historical graph of, of 2,000 years of Israeli history. But my second favorite business book is probably probably The Hard Thing About Hard Things. I think it's just a really fun book by Ben Horowitz. Mm-hmm. You can learn a lot from that book. It's also a book in my, uh, in my course that I have students read. Mm-hmm. Um, favorite... Oh, dinner. Who would I have dinner with? Have dinner with. Um, I mean, I am. I, I love. I love um, history. I really, really love history. Mm-hmm. And one of the most fascinating characters in history, and even though it's cliche, so mm-hmm. I hate to say it, but it, it, Abraham Lincoln is, a, is an incredibly interesting figure in, in history because, as a leader. He had something called a team of rivals. He brought all the people that hated him the most mm-hmm. and had the most against his presidency to become his cabinet. Mm-hmm. And that's just remarkable because people typically did backroom decisions around things. Mm-hmm. I was obviously ahead of his time around around many other social issues, which are still not where they, even close to where they need to be today. Mm-hmm. Um, I would I would say I would say Abraham Lincoln. And then, in terms of not to be too cliche, um, and then, and then, uh, and then, what was the last question? Uh, the last question is: Who made the biggest impact in your in your career? Oh, or, or life? My wife. Oh, nice. My wife. So my wife is like an executive. Is not she is an executive coach? And what's great about being executive coach and being an executive is I get like built in coaching all all the time. <laughs> so I'm lucky. And, and the and the and the well, what I have to pay is really a very reasonable rate. Uh, just kidding. I don't <laughs> just owe your salary. <laughs> so so, you know, I would say mm-hmm. that um, we're very lucky to have a really great partnership, mm-hmm. and uh, I would say she's more influential in my life than anything else, both personally and professionally. Thank you so much, David, for coming. This was fun. Loved loved it. Thank you again, Grace. 